as the great John Anik says, a Boston native like yourself, Theo, one more sleep to go until UFC 300. Massive card ahead. Big betting show ahead as well. We did quite well. We, you know, we normally go back. We normally go and, and look at what we did the last time. Mixed bag of results again on, on the bets, but we did get a plus 981 parlay up on the last betting show. So that should give you a reason to tune into this one. So hopefully you picked that up the last time. We'll try and do our service to you and pick some of the best bets on UFC 300. Um, a card where plenty of money could be won, plenty of money can be lost. But as I say, ahead of all of the betting shows and before we get into the nitty gritty side of things bet responsibly if if it's not fun stop doing it we'll share all of the uh hotlines for you know gamblers aware and everything in the descriptions of this you know we're having a bit of fun we're not ha we're not betting experts we're going to share our opinions on who and where we think the money is going to be won and lost on the night and uh, that's about it. Yeah, no units, no nothing. Just a little bit of a chit chat, a little bit of an explanation on why we're going the way we're going on some of our bets. And I'll hand it over to Theo. What is the excitement levels? I know we were chatting a little bit before we came on, but this is uh, an absolutely epic card ahead and, and lots to pick from in terms of betting too, Theo. I cannot wait. I think it's the perfect one to look at. As in terms of like a fight card, if you're looking for you know value on either side, because every fight on here is is high level. It's it's a high you know level MMA card, so everyone's kind of seen all these fighters pretty often. Even if you're a more casual fan than most, so I feel like it's going to be a good one for the discourse. I feel like a lot of people who maybe aren't as into the UFC are going to be able to pay more attention to this one than usual. And at the end of the day, man, we've spent a lot of time sort of looking at the calendar of 2024 and saying, ah, oh, well, maybe 299 is better than 300. And this rough stretch of Apex cards is really killing my soul. And now that we're on to fight week, I think we can admit we were kind of overreacting a little bit because this card is just so much deeper than 299. You can say what you want about maybe the top couple fights, maybe not living up to what the 300 expectations would have been, whatever that means. But this card is arguably the deepest in the history of the company, and I cannot wait to get into this with you, bud. Definitely, definitely is. And that's what we'll just do right now. Let's get straight into it. Main event. I know I got some money on the line for the main event. Let's talk a little bit about the fight first, Theo. Um, you know, I, I give, you know, what I think is going to happen on, on this week's preview show. If you haven't seen it, you can check it out on the YouTube channel as well. In short, in short, Theo, my opinion on the main event is that I just feel it's going to be a tough, tough night for Jamal Hill. I think when you're coming back after such uh, a serious injury, like an Achilles injury, and you're you're facing a calf kicker as good as Alex Pejia, I called it a recipe for disaster on the preview show, and I think that's what it is. Um, I think he's very open on the feet. There are ways that Jamal Hill can get it done, like my, my good friend Richie, he does fancy Jamal Hill. He, you know, he said he hits like a truck. And, and you know, he's not wrong. He does hit like a truck. But is he going to be able to get at Alex Pejia? Is he going to be able to close the distance? You know, obviously, a takedown is another option for Jamal Hill. But, you know, he seems to interested in, in and, and seems very confident in standing and banging. I'm just very, uh, very curious to hear what your thoughts are on this fight overall before we get into where the money is, Tio. I mean, honestly, the, the more and more I thought about this fight, the more towards one side I went. Um, the, the bad news, Ian, is in the last three times that I have switched my main event pick during fight week, it has lost every time. I am 0-3 in doing that move, and I did it again for this week because our man Harry Powell actually convinced me in the group chat about this one when we talked about how the matchup actually plays out. It's it's a stylistic matchup that I, I think people will just imagine the wrong ways. They're not looking at the actual openings for either guy on each side. And the more you actually look at this fight, the more confusing the line is. I'm surprised that this fight is actually basically a pick 'em. You know, I think it should be a lot more spread out for the for the actual favorite here. And um I can't wait to see what happens here. There's so many different factors that lead into this, and honestly, anything could happen, but I do think this this line is a bit closer than it should be at the end of the day. Yeah, it definitely is. And I, I was surprised as well. Um, looking in and looking at the line itself, we have Alex Behea at minus 138 on Bet365, is where I'm going to shout out all of my prices today. Jamal Hill plus 110 um, coming into this fight. Uh, you know, they're basically calling it a pick 'em. 
look, look at Alex Bahia, you know, maybe in certain terms, the bookies might feel he's somewhat unproven uh, as of yet, but I think he was fairly rock solid against Yuri Prohachka. I think Yuri possessed a lot of, you know, difficulty in terms of him being our unorthodox strikes that he throws. But uh, to me, it was the defining factor and it's the, it's almost the be all and end all. And I mentioned it already. It's the calf kick. You look back at Yuri Prohachka versus Alex Bahia and the first, the first calf kick that Alex Bahia throws in that fight and commits on takes Yuri Prohachka off his feet. And you can see the complete shift in kind of, you know, maybe mentality in Yuri Prohachka where he's immediately thinking about that as well. It's all well and good thinking, you know, you're going to go in and you're going to, you know, land a big shot if you're Jamal Hill, but you've got to get past those leg kicks. And I'm not sure from what I've seen in previous fights that Jamal Hill has the capabilities of getting away from those calf kicks, Tio. It's like he's very heavy. He's very open and, and wide with his shots, throws uh, very kind of loop and wide hooks and leaves his chin wide up in the air as well. And the calf kicks do um, open up lots more shots for Alex Bahia. That's what he does. He wants to kind of get you low first, break down, like chopping down the tree per se, you know, get those arms down and down, get somebody thinking about that calf kick. Then we see him unleashing uh, some of his boxing and he's done so with John Strickland. He's done it with Yuri. Uh, you know, he dropped Yuri in that, you know, everyone talks about the elbow finish, but he dropped Yuri coming in that time. And I mean, it's a thing, you know, Jamal Hill is going to have to be super careful on the outside here and wary of the leg kicks, but also be very wary not to rush in here against such a heavy puncher like Alex Bahia. And, you know, I'm not sure I've seen enough from Jahil to, to, to say that he's not going to kind of get himself into a lot of trouble here early days in this fight. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever told this story on any severe platforms or not, but even if I have, I'll just go for it anyways. You know, a younger Theo Lander was in the bellies of Madison Square Garden for UFC 268, Usman Covington 2. I was there to cover the UFC debut of Ian Gary, and I was backstage waiting for him to come back for his post-fight scrum, which he was, of course, late to, which proved to be a theme that would follow him through his career, but I digress. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Chris Curtis came up to the stage, and in comes Sean Strickland and the team from – you know, their gym and we're standing off to the side and we're watching the TV because they have a couple of screens in the back that show the actual broadcast as it's happening in the arena. And out comes this guy who I've been told has beat Israel Asanya twice in kickboxing as a real monster is coming into the UFC a little bit late in the game, but he has the chance to maybe get fast tracked to the middleweight title. It's Alex Pereira and he's fighting a guy who I honestly forget his name at this point, with all due respect to that gentleman. Was it his first fight or second it fight? Was his, it was his first fight because he debuted at MSG. It was Michaelidis then. So Michaelidis then, yes. So we're all watching a group. It's like me, Strickland, Nixick, and then like a couple of reporters are all watching like in a half circle around the TV. And Alex throws, of course, this miraculous picture-perfect flying knee to end the fight. And I believe in the beginning of the second round. Mm-hmm. And we're all sort of, you know, shooting the shit together. Strickland's off there. And for the record, Strickland is exactly who you think he is off camera. There, there's no faking with that guy. He is the maniac you think he is. And he's about to leave the room. And I, I look over at him and I just say, you know, Strickland, this is a guy in your division. You know, if you had to face a guy like that, like, you know, how would you approach that? Obviously, Pereira is a glory kickboxer, a legendary artist of that sport. And Sean Strickland looks at me like I have 10 heads. Like I just asked him the dumbest question in the world. And he goes, what do you mean? I'm a kickboxer. I kickbox him and kind of laughs it off, smirks, and he leaves the room. It was the last thing he said before he left. And I remember on that night I thought about it and I was like, that's a really bad idea. Flash forward to the following summer. I'm at UFC 276 up in the nosebleeds watching Pereira versus Strickland. And down he goes. And so I always thought about that. And I always thought about, you know, the perspective of Alex Pereira and, you know, maybe the ego of UFC fighters seeing high level kickboxers come to the UFC and thinking to themselves like, I can stand with that guy. Why couldn't I stand with that guy? And I'm hearing a lot of the same out of Jamal Hill. I'm hearing him say these things like he's not this monster you think he is, blah, 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 all this stuff. And I just see him falling to the same fate. I, I don't see how Jamal Hill could beat Alex Pereira when at range. And unfortunately for Jamal, his best weapons are at range. So if he's going to win this fight, he's going to have to mix it up into areas of his game that he's not that great at. You know, even though he's a tremendous striker, in tight, in the pocket, maybe dirty boxing, getting in, in the clinch up against the cage, 
I don't see him having an ability to do that. And I don't see him ever, you know, showing us in his previous fights in the UFC to be able to win a fight due to offensive grappling, let alone for five rounds. And when you think about that, along with the fact that he's coming back from the same Achilles tear that Aaron Rodgers was saying he was going to come back in nine months and everyone was freaking out that that was so insane. Jamal Hill is doing it in eight months and he's doing it against perhaps the best kicker in the history of the division. So the more and more you think about this fight, the more you say, man, what is Jamal Hill's path to victory? And so when you look at how close this line is, I was forced to take Alex Pereira. I had no, I had no option. A hundred percent. So you went straight up with Alex Pereira. Straight up money line. I believe it'll be a knockout, but mm. I could see him outstriking him over the five rounds. And you, you believe it being a knockout is kind of going to teeter in onto what my first pick was. And I actually did pick him. Look, at I got getting a little bit brave. A plus 120 Alex Pereira to get the knockout. I think... I'd be surprised from either end. You know, look at. I think you explained that whole scenario excellently. Well, it was a great story and a great like reasoning into. And what I'm thinking in this fight too is that you know the avenues I can see Jamal Hill get winning here are very very small. It's not beyond the realms of possibility, but they are very very small. How conditioned is that leg? Because we've seen you know one kick is all it takes for Pahia, and and it almost changes your world. So. First fight, Alex Bahia, straight up one, minus one three eight or, or whatever price. Did you get him at that price? One three eight. I got him at one thirty. So one thirty in the round, and uh, yeah, one twenty plus one twenty for Alex Bahia by knockout. We'll flash up all of our picks at the end. Um, co-main event. Do you have any action in the co-main event? Uh, Zhang Weili versus Yan Joinan. You know, it's just such a wide line on that one. A lot of Jean Wiley's fights are like that, that I, I didn't know what way to go about it. You know, I thought about doing the over in the rounds, but I didn't really love that because I think that there's a chance that, you know, Jean Wiley gets her down and gets her out of there quickly. Um, I, I just didn't know, man. That was one that I want to stay away from just to be safe for. Um, don't feel the need to bet the entire board here. Same as, same as here. Like, too, it, you're, it, you're getting too much into guesswork. Maybe a cheeky, cheeky fiver bet on a prediction and a round or something like that uh, on the night. But minus 450 for Zhang Weili, plus 350 for Yan Nan. Um, I, I, I'm very, very confident of a Zhang Weili fight uh, or win, I mean, excuse me. Um, but yeah, how anybody decides to spend their money there is uh, it's going to be very interesting. It's a bit of a, a shot in the dark there. We'll stop on Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. I know I've got some money on this. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on this fight, Teal. You know what's funny about this one is when it first got announced, it was almost disgust that people had a reaction to. They're saying, why would you do this to Max Holloway? Why would you send him back up to lightweight where he didn't look big enough when he was fighting Justin Poirier and you're going to give him the guy who hits harder than anyone in the division with those nasty leg kicks? You know, and, and then slowly over time, the discourse of the MMA fan base became, oh, actually, I rate Holloway in this matchup. You know, he's a cheeky underdog here. I see openings for him in this fight. Did you see that picture of him on Instagram? That's totally not just taken at the right angle with the pe with the best lighting that all the fighters do before every single fight? Like, I couldn't believe how quickly it shifted to now Max Holloway is just like the, the bona fide, you know, consensus underdog pick on this card. The fact that I'm going to get Justin Gaethje at minus 165 here, I think is tremendous value. Um, not to say that, you know, I think he's going to finish Holloway or anything, but like, you know, if you just look at their last couple of fights, I think Justin Gaethje has done an excellent job here of calming himself down, not getting baited into firefights, being a lot more calm and calculated and picking out his shots. Whereas Max Holloway, you know, not to say that he's gotten more reckless, but it, it doesn't seem like the same master classes that he used to put on when he had the title. It seems like he's been on a bit of a decline, although he is still getting wins. And if you're looking at the sport of MMA, you know momentum is massive. Gaethje's just going up. Holloway's a bit dipping down, and he's going up a weight class. I, I had no choice but to go with Gaethje here. Uh, very, very, very smart way of thinking there, and I can't disagree with anything that you said. Um, sometimes the way I, I've convinced myself that Max can win this fight, but it's not going to be easy if he does do it, Theo. Um, in terms of speed and footwork, I definitely would class Max Holloway, um, the quicker and the more agile fighter on the feet here. And I think what his job is going to be is to try and go in there and 
frustrate Justin Gaethje. Get in, get out, uh, maybe drop a round or two, but I don't think Max Holloway's route to victory here is standing toe-to-toe and going to war with Justin Gaethje. It's not going to end good for him. Justin Gaethje hits too hard, is too devastating. What Max Holloway has got to do in this fight, I believe, to win is stick and move, stick and move, stick and move, frustrate. Um, What he's got to do, and I think it's going to be the winning and losing of this fight, is stay away from the leg kicks of Justin Gaethje. Absolutely devastating. And we've seen Alex Volkanovsky have his way with Max Holloway with leg kicks too. So that would be a big worry for me. But if Max Holloway is still there in rounds three and rounds four and rounds five, he's got a damn good chance of squeaking out, uh, in my opinion, a decision win. That's why I've gone for Max Holloway at plus money, at plus 137. Uh, to get the win am i confident in that bet not really but i've i've gone too far and i've gone too hard on the paint on max holloway this week not to back him as one of my bets straight up um you know takedowns are there for max holloway too we know we've seen justin be exposed when his back hits the mat as well um and uh, i don't know whether max does that i think you know uh, we uh, me, harry and i had a a little bit of over and back, and he did kind of convince me that, you know, it's not really Max's style or in his kind of bloodstream to kind of go and fight off of a game plan. I think he wants to throw down. I think he wants to prove himself against a really, really devastating striker in Justin Gaethje. And look, at he may be on the way out. Maybe it was a lack of motiva- motivation here to, you You know, fighting, you know, being the perennial number one contender and, and being a number one contender gatekeeper is what Max Holloway has had to be over the last number of years, uh, apart from his fights with Alex Volkanovsky. And maybe he just saw no end goal here. Maybe he just didn't see anywhere that was going to get him motivated to a place that he needs to be. He seems in the zone this week. He seems ready for a war. And I think that Justin Gaethje might bring the best Max Holloway out of it. Is the best going to be good enough to take out Justin Gaethje or to get a win over Justin Gaethje? That's the fun part. We don't know. I'm going to gamble and I'm going to say at plus 137 it is. You've gone for Justin Gaethje on the money line as well. We're going head to head on the money line on that one. And I'm very, very excited for that one. It's going to be ridiculously ridiculously good um to to see these guys throwing down um we shall move on any action i know i don't have any action for a little bit on the main card you have any more action on the main card that we want to discuss yeah i do the last one that i have for the main card is actually the armand sarukin v charles Oliveira fight um again you know we're talking about another lightweight fight here i don't know which one of these fights will actually be for the number one contender spot you know all four guys involved seem to believe that with a win they'd be next in line we never really know until the fights get scheduled of course and maybe dustin poirier has something to say about that as well um but regardless of that the Oliveira sarukin matchup is fascinating to me you know because Armand is, is just like, Armand's never had a true submission attempt go against him in the UFC. You know, every time that someone's ever like about to set something up, a goal for a triangle or something like that, he immediately denies it. I think the difference with Charles Oliveira is that Armand's never fought someone who's going to be as relentless going for the submission as everyone else. You know, I think Charles Oliveira is going to be much more dangerous off his back than anyone Armand's ever faced. I think Charles Oliveira is much more dangerous in transition, especially than anyone's Armand and than anyone Armand's ever faced. You know, and you saw the fight with Gamrot and those tremendous scrambles. That's like one of the best wrestling MMA fights I've ever seen in my life. So to well, watch- I'll give I'll go even one better at that with Armin. I think you want go back and look at his um debut against Islam Mahachev. Yes, like, this is Armin Saryukin's first fight in the octagon, and he's out there scrambling away with Islam and doing quite well in those exchanges as well. That was a performance that that made me, and I've tweeted out it was back in 2019 where I tweeted out that Armin Saryukian was going to be a lightweight champion. I still believe that, but, you know, I'll, I'll get into my explanation. I'm sorry for interrupting. Please round up your thoughts no, on the fight. No, no, sir. So, anyways, just to wrap this up, I, I just think that, you know, Oliveira is a lot more dangerous on the ground to finish the fight than anyone he's ever fought, including Islam Mahachev at that stage, at least. And I think that Charles Oliveira is the most unpredictable, most powerful, and most dangerous guy on the feet that Armand Sarukian's ever faced. I think a lot of people have sort of seen the last couple of performances from Armand Sarukian said, oh, it was Benil Dariush. They have an excuse for that. Um, and, and I forget the name of the other guy that he had fought on short notice that actually dropped him at one point. But, um, you know, 
Armand Sarukin's just sort of had the steady incline. And I think he's running into a monster here in Charles Oliveira. And, you know, pull back the curtain a little bit. We're doing this after the weigh-ins. I think Oliveira looked great on the scales. There were some rumors that maybe he wasn't going to make the weight as easily this time. But there seems to always be with Charles. There always he does is. Look, it always seems to be a little bit. And he doesn't look great on the scales, but he, he seems to be able to rehydrate well. Yes. But you, you, you're, you're going with Charles for this one. Are you going straight up? Are you going by prediction? What are you thinking? Well, the big one everyone's talking about on social media is that Oliveira by submission is apparently plus 800, which is fantastic odds. I'm not going to get sucked into it. I really, really want to. But I do think there's so much of a chance that he could knock him out on the feet here that I don't want to shoehorn myself into that. So I'm just going to take him straight up on Moneyline. That's going to be plus 185. That's great value in this matchup because I think he's a stylistic nightmare for Armand. So I'm just going to play it safe here. Yeah, 100%. Look at uh, money is coming in hard on 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 a KOs and submissions. Um, you know, KO was plus seven fifty yesterday. That's down to plus six hundred right now for Charles Oliveira. Submission is down to plus four hundred. So if you're listening to this and you're looking to try and put uh, on on Charles Oliveira to finish, you want to be getting on that fairly quickly because people are hammering that. And I think you know a lot of people would have been looking at Charles on the scales today and making their pick. You know, I know I don't like putting down any money till I see them on the final scale and the final way. And and uh, I think a lot of people were happy, like what you said as well, of what they've seen with Charles on the scale. Uh, I like that bet. I I stayed away from it this time around. I've picked Charles to win by unanimous decision, would you believe it or not? I'm going against what you said, but I think, you know, Arman is a good scrambler. I think he's not going to be easy to submit. Could he get knocked out? Yes, he could get knocked out. Could he get hurt? And could he have Charles? I this is where this is the way I foresee the fight going. I see Mads exchanges on the feet, maybe one or two guys getting clipped. The fight going down. I feel Charles is going to scramble a little bit better than Armin, and his positional Brazilian jiu jitsu is a little bit better, I think. Than Armin, so you can I can see Charles securing back control, get locking in a body triangle, and just doing enough to win rounds in this fight. And I think that's all he needs to secure on the ground. Um, and I'm very curious to see how this one. I love Armin Saryukin as a fighter. As I said, I think he's going to be a future uh, light heavyweight or lightweight champion, whether he wins or loses this fight. Um, you know, it's you're not going to get Charles Oliveira at plus money and at that this good value maybe even ever, unless he's a massive, massive underdog against a real up-and-coming talent. But uh, I like your pick there, Charles. Money line plus 185. Good money there. And I, I said, if you want your method of victory, if you want to go with what, what I'm saying and, and you, you're you're picking the decision here, that's that's 10 to 1. That's plus 1,000. So I might put an old cheeky fiver on that. But this is just such a wild fight. It's going to be a one that's really hard to kind of define what happens and uh, I, I'm excited for this one as well. Um, moving on down the card, we'll skip by um, Bo Nickel. Uh, Bo Nickel is a kind of a pick him, will he submit him, will he knock him out kind of a job. There is two eye of a price at minus like 1200. Um, but what we will stop on, we will stop on Yuri Prohachka versus Alexander Rakic. Um, Yuri Prohachka, I'm going to go straight in here to you. Yuri Prohachka is plus 100 in this fight, and I think it's a fan fantastic fight you know we don't know how much the shoulder injury t- has taken out of Yuri Prohachka um was he back to full 100% when he fought Alex Bahia last time out we won't know until we see him fight here but I just think he's mad on orthodox style is going to be too much for Alexander Rakic's slow methodical somewhat robotic style and I'm not, i don't mean that with any disrespect but you know what i said about yiri um on the preview show this week i think sometimes he surprises himself with the shots that he's going to throw he's that like in the moment he's he, he's like a chameleon in the way that he can kind of shape his strikes and shape his movement to kind of the opponent that he's facing off and the shots that are being thrown at him so you know, Yuri Prohachka at plus 100, Alexander Rakic at minus 125. If it is a pick em fight, and I'm picking Yuri Prohachka here as the live dog to you, what about yourself? Are you, or do you have any action on this? I'm staying away from this one for, you know, really one reason. There's just too many question marks on this one for me. Um, you know, if I just think about the fight stylistically, 
you know, um, Prohoshka is a guy who always likes to come forward, spinning like a Beyblade, throwing crazy stuff, very unorthodox, just fights like an absolute madman. And Rakic is a guy who maybe wants to slow the fight down. He's more than happy to fight off the back foot and retreat around the octagon. So I think he'll be comfortable, at least with the way that Yuri is coming at him, until he hits him with something he's not even close to expecting. Um, but with that being said, you know, where is Yuri's mentality at? after the finish he received from Alex Pereira just back in November here. I know he didn't really go fully out there. At least it didn't seem like he did. So I don't think that his brain is really damaged too much, but not, not too much. Look, he took a heavy shot. And like yeah, I said, did. like when he rushed in, he, he took a heavy shot. He, he's got an ability to take a shot. Like where his head is at, I think he would. I think in his own head, he probably feels that might have been a little bit of an early stoppage. So, I think so you know, that, too. that's the way that you'll justify that. But, you know, you can't lure, lure yourself down a false sense of security here going in, especially against a guy like Rackage. But Rackage, Rackage isn't known for his one shot power. He has not that much. Uh, what? How many knockouts? 33% of his fights are, um, are, are by TKO or KO more so of a decision merchant here. So, I mean, if you're unsure about this fight and you want to bet on the fight to go the distance, uh, that's plus 150 for the fight to go the distance. I don't mind that bet whatsoever, but I think Yuri is going to be coming out here guns a blazing, and I think he might get Alexander Rackage out of there. But like I said, there is a lot of unknowns, but I could not uh, I could not go past Yuri Prohachka at plus 100 in this fight. I think he probably should be in the minuses, and uh, I snatched that up. Very good price at plus 100. Uh, moving on, Calvin Cater, Aljamain Sterling. I know we have a little bit of action in the parlay here. Any action here on any of your, uh, of your big bets, Theo? Nothing on my card, but I am thinking about Aljamain Sterling in this matchup. I just think that he looks so much better up at 145. He looks like he's enjoying the process of even just fight week a lot more. And stylistically, I think Calvin Cater struggles against guys like Aljamain Sterling, who can just sort of grind you out on the ground, threaten you with submissions, so you can't really risk getting up that much. I, I think the price on this one's a little bit crazy. I think Aljamain should be a bigger favorite, but I guess there are question marks about how he looks at 145. I'm wagering he's going to look great at this weight class. The, yeah, the thing about this, I think, with the bookies, they might be a little bit wary of, of how Aljo will perform at 145. I think he's going to have bags of energy. He looks absolutely yoked at 145 as well. And it's a good stylistic matchup against a, a somewhat, like, you know, defensive wrestle boxer. You know, Calvin Cater is going to look to try and defend the takedowns, keep the fight on the feet. You know, very tight knit on the feet. Probably it would give the, a slight advantage in some areas on the feet to Calvin Cater. But I feel, you know, Aljo is going to want to put him on his back and punish him and, and, and kind of lay a good kind of pace on Calvin Cater. Over the course of three rounds, I can see Aljo getting it done. I'll talk a little bit more. Yeah, I'll talk about more about that. We got, we've got a little parlay action here. We'll move to Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison, another cracker in the women's 135 pound division. Kayla Harrison, she's successively made weight. Um, she's coming in here for a UFC debut. Uh, do you have any action on this one, Theo? Another one where the line is very wide, and I was also doing these before the weigh-ins, so I didn't know if Kayla was even going to make the weight, so there was a lot to think about there. Now, obviously, in hindsight, this morning, she did make the weight. She looked scary on the scales. I, I, well, she looked gaunt enough, enough, which I, I was expecting, though. I was expecting course, that. Like, I mean, if she's look, she looked like she had somewhat bit of energy. You know, she didn't look frail. She had good – her legs were under her a little bit. Obviously, didn't look great, and it, I think that was a big battle for her. And I think the question is, is how much it will take it out – how much the wake-up will take out of her performance, Theo. Does that kind of give you a level of uncertainty heading into this fight? Yeah, and honestly, the the only other thing is is that I, I don't think it would be enough for her to actually lose this fight to Holly Holm. I think maybe it would make it closer than it should be because Holly Holm's someone that we've been talking about for a while now. I remember the last time that we did a balanced breakdown of a Holly Holm main event, we were saying, like, what is Holly Holm still fighting for? Like, what, what's her real motivation here? Is she thinks she's going to go on a title run? Like, you know, is she a little bit over the hill? And she's coming against Kayla Harrison, who's going to be much bigger than her, much stronger than her. She's going to have a huge grappling advantage. It, it just spells a nightmare all over for Holly Holm. So I, I think really the only thing that could happen via this weight cut is that is a Kayla gets slowed down rather than completely fall apart. So I, I didn't really want to just take her on money line because I think it could just be a decision if she gets too tired or, or worn out overall. It's interesting that you say worn out because I feel that, you know, first time fighting at 135 ever, she's going to have a lot of kind of testing. How much is she going to kind of hold back? I feel that she is going to fade in this fight. 
big factor here, Kayla Harrison will be allowed to throw elbows. Uh, she was never allowed to throw elbows in the PFL, so I'm excited to see her unleash some elbows. I feel if she can get this fight down, she's going to be very dangerous on top. But I think Holly Holm is savvy enough to kind of keep herself safe. And I, 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 I did go for Kayla, and I'm banking on Kayla really fading in this fight. Um, and I've gone for her via decision. Um to win a decision and the price that I have for that is minus or plus 130, which is not great for a prediction one, but you know, you can get some good odds on, on perhaps her getting a submission, uh, which is uh plus 260, a knockout or uh, TKO is plus 350. I mean, she could do some serious damage with elbows, get her out of her that way. She could do damage and then get the submission. I'm banking on Holly home being sound enough on the ground to kind of keep herself out of danger, do just enough to remain in this fight. And I, I feel we're going to see a somewhat dominant decision win from Kayla Harrison. Plus 130 for me on that. That's what I'm going for there. But I can understand your hesitancy to kind of get tucked in um, for that one as well, Theo. Um, before we get down more on the card, any other the fights that we have coming up that you have any action on, Theo, that you want to stop on? Uh, yeah, I just want to circle real quick back to Bo Nickel by sub is plus 100. That's on my card as well here. Um, I think honestly, you know, Bo Nickel is coming as apparently the largest favorite in UFC history. Some people have him as high as minus two, 2,500, which is insane that this is on the main card of UFC 300, but I digress. Um, Bo Nickel by sub is in my opinion, like the most likely outcome for this fight. We've seen mm. Cody Brunson just get out grappled by much lesser guys, let alone, some people call Bo Nickel the, the greatest NCAA wrestler of all time. He's a legend from Penn State. He's overwhelmingly stronger than this guy. You know, I, I think Cody Bundes has a very tall task in front of him, and, and more likely than not, Bo sort of wears him out, probably gets a sub towards the end of the first round, but submission at plus money it was too tempting not to take. Well, you could go submission, but you can also, uh, for me, what what I'm not sure, and I what you said is, is, is very, very true, but will he will he go for the ground and pound as well which you know if he has him in a little bit of tricky circumstances you know by submission here you said you got a plus 100 that's already down here in bet 365 at minus six one six three so people are lumping on the submission here you can still get plus money on the ko i'm i'm of the opinion you know flick of a coin here you know, he could get him hurt. He could just rain down punches on him. He could hurt him. He could take the back. He could rear naked choke him. It's kind of like a flick of a coin for me. I think this decision and how it goes is basically going to be down to what way Bo Nickel wants to finish the fight, to be honest, Theo. And, uh, you know, if you got plus 100 on that submission, man, kudos to you because that's where all the betters, that's where all the punters are looking to put the money down. So, um, yeah, serious going right there. I'll stop off just to just to share uh, some odds for Sadiq Youssef versus uh, Diego Lopez. Uh, plus 125 for Sadiq Youssef, minus 150 for Diego Lopez. Um, I like Diego Lopez in this fight, but, you know, this is a, you know, Yusuf can be a tricky guy that plus 125 does have value, but I just feel that Diego Lopez is a little bit more well-rounded, has ways to win this fight. You know, uh, I think he's explosive on the feet. Uh, I think Yusuf does have power, but Diego Lopez is not going to do what Yusuf likes to do to guys, and that's close the distance, get into the clinch, use his strength to kind of control the clinch, land shots. I think Lopez is going to give him uh, a little bit of a hardship in those clinch exchanges and, and make it difficult for him. But, you know, that's a pick em fight. I mean, it's a hard one to call how it's going to go. I do fancy Diego Lopez on that too. Jalen Turner, uh, and I'll ask you for your opinions on all, both of these. I'll just run through them real quickly. And and if you have any action on any of these fights, please stop me in my tracks as well, Theo. Jalen Turner, Renato Maicano, Money Maicano back, plus 200 for him, minus 250 for Jalen Turner. I really fancy Jalen Turner in this one. I fancy him to get a knockout as well. That's minus 120. Not too much value in that as well. If you want to kind of get the best value here, you know, Jalen Turner by round two knockout is what I would say. He might not even get that far. That's plus 375 for me. I think that's just good value in that. I've chosen to stay away from that altogether. It's not on my official picks for here. And he picks... Uh, that uh, get you going for any of those fights or do you have anything in those fights or thoughts on that those fights deal my only real thoughts on the Sadiq Youssef versus Diego Lopez fights I stayed away just because I don't 
I don't know if I can safely say that Diego Lopez is a proven commodity at this point in his UFC career. And that's not to say it's his fault. He's just very early in the game for the UFC level. Um, Sadiq Youssef, you know, if you look at the Edson Barbosa fight, he hurt him, wobbled him really bad, basically just dominated the entire first round. And then he kind of faded over the course of five rounds and lost a decision to Edson. So I, I think he's going to be able to control his pace a little bit better in this three-round format. I think that bodes well for him. Um, I'm a little surprised to see him as the underdog, but again, this this fight is 50-50. If Lopez I had to pick, good man. I mean, Lopez tested good. himself in in his debut against Mavsar Evelev, and you know, whilst he didn't win that fight, um, you know, he definitely gave a good account of himself on like six days' notice. Has come right. in and got a first round submission and got a first round knockout. So he he got the big test for his for his for his UFC debut. They backscaled him a little bit. He proved too good to to, to be backscaled. Now you know we're, he's getting another taste at at, mm. at top fifteen action. So mm. it, this you know your your doubts are valid here. You know what I mean. We don't know with him yet. Um, it'll be very interesting. This is going to tell us how how good he is or if he is going to be able to be, to be a mainstay at uh, one thirty five as well. Uh, moving on down the rest of the card here. Um, we've got Jessica Andrade versus Marina Rodriguez. Jessica Andrade at minus 138. Marina Rodriguez at plus 110. We've got Bobby Green and Jim Miller. Uh, Bobby Green at minus 175. We've got uh, Jim Miller at plus 150. Davison Figueredo we've got at minus 334. And Cody Garbrandt at uh, plus 250 in that one in the bantamweight division. Any action in any of those three fights, Theo? Yes, I love the fight for Jim Miller against Bobby Green. Jim Miller has not been finished since he submitted to Charles Oliveira in 2018. Bobby Green's last three losses have all been by knockout. Not to mention, you know, he took a tremendous amount of punishment uh, in his most recent loss to Jalen Turner. That super late stoppage where he, he seemed like he went out almost three times. You know, that's the type of punishment you take in a fight where you don't know if a guy's going to be the same. And so he's coming off of that. That was only four months ago. So did he take enough time? Is this just a bad matchup for him? And I think people are honestly just sort of wagering that, you know, Jim Miller is going to be over the hill here. He's 40 years old. He hasn't looked bad in his last couple of fights, man. He definitely has. And he's no, a he strong fella still too. So I think he could grind it out here on Bobby Green. And I think there's a good chance we have a really good feel good moment on UFC 300 by way of Jim Miller. So I, I have I really do hope a lot so. of respect. This is a respect I, one. Yeah, a hundred percent. Max respect for Jim Miller. Unfortunately, I'm not as confident. I'm trying to not let the heart rule the head with my assessment here. I think Bobby Green might be a little bit too elusive for him on the feet. Not easy guy to finish either. Like, like I said, your 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 concerns heading in are valid, but uh, with Jim Miller, will he have the power? Will he be able to get in with his boxing here? I'm not too sure. I think Bobby Green has, you know, a very very awkward style. When he gets into a good flow, he's very difficult to stop. I think he's going to try and uh, I think he, he he will win a decision here. A minus one seventy five. I think he's a good price. I have him also in the parlay as well. But uh, look, at I hope I'm wrong on that. I really do. But I, I, I got to go with what I feel in this fight. And I think that Bobby Green is just a little bit too elusive for Jim Miller. And, you know, whilst he did get knocked out four months ago, it was only last October that he took out Grant Dawson as well, um, who is a, a, a pretty good guy. Um, but it'll be interesting. I'm really hoping for a fairy tale ending for, for Jim Miller. We'll see what happens in that one. Um, Dawson Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. Any action in that one? There's going to be plenty of action in the fight. Do you have There's going to be plenty of action in the <laughs> fight. Yeah. You know what? I, I might steal this one from your playbook here, so I don't want to spoil it. But early on this fight, a lot of action. Obviously, Figueredo is a big favorite here. But, you know, if you think it's going to go either way, I, you'd imagine Garbrandt's going to do it early. Davidson is powerful as well, facing a guy who's coming up in weight. You know, obviously, Car Cody Garbrandt was the bantamweight champion, but he went down, now back up. You know, is he acclimated fully to 135? Is Davidson Figueredo going to be good enough at, at 135 as well? Because he was a uh, flyweight for a very long time. But I think his power translates. I think he's crafty enough. I think he's had the championship experience that's going to help him in this fight. I, I, I want to stay away from it just because I thought that the price was a little bit too sweet. But, you know, for, for your pick, I'm a big fan, so I'll steal that from you. Yeah, no problem, man. I'm uh, I'm all about sharing here on the betting show. Uh, my pick is either Davison Figueredo or Cody Garbrandt to win in round one. Now, obviously, I fancy Davison Figueredo here big time. He might not even... He might, you know, there might be a chance where we don't see a knockout here, but we've seen Ch Cody get clipped before and go down. 
Uh, Cody does have power too, so I'm just covering my ass really, to be honest, in picking both of these guys in round one because, you know, there could be a wild exchange. We can say what we like about Cody, but he definitely still has the power there to do damage. I think we saw that in his last... I was down at his last fight at... Uh, uh, in Vegas uh, at the end of the year and, you know, put on a good performance there. But, you know, I think these two guys coming out, it's been a fight that's been in the works for a long time. They both want to fight each other. They obviously both want to fight each other because they both think that they're going to win. And, uh, you know, which every fighter does really, that's a really fairly lazy uh, analysis. But both of them are hungry. The 300,000 uh, performance bonus, I think, is going to spur these guys on. There's a reason the UFC put this as the first fight of the night, because they know and expect these guys to deliver, and I think they're going to put that on their backs, and they're going to go out there and throw holy hell in round one, and I think uh, one of them is going to drop, and, uh, you know, if this is the thing, it's either going to be finished in round one, or it's going to go to a decision, I think. You know what I mean? I think it's kind of one of those fights, but I'm buzzing for this fight. It's brilliant. Uh, Dabson Figueredo has looked excellent, excellent at uh, Bantamweight. So if you're looking for uh, either one of these guys to win in round one, plus 210 is the money, to, plus 210 is the price. Uh, that's what I went for there. I like that one. That could give us a nice little uh, kitty of cash heading into the rest of the card to put down. Um, that leads us on into our, our parlay picks, Theo. So I'll just take down the graphic here right now. We'll, uh, we'll blast up the parlay picks for us. Um, Whenever you get the chance, there um, we, like I said, we picked up a a really good um, plus nine eighty one parlay the last time. Not as pricey this time, but still pretty good. If you, I do say so myself. Not easy to get a four leg parlay up to you. So I think we did quite well the last time out. Uh, to be honest with that. I've gone myself, obviously I talked about Bobby Green and his chances here. We're kind of going against the grain a little bit with some of our main picks, but look at win or lose on some occasions here, it can do us a little bit of favours. Uh, Bobby Green, money line minus 175. I've gave my explanation there on Bobby Green. Aljamain Sterling, I kind of talked about Aljo as well. Very uh, good price for me for his debut over at 145, a minus 170 there. Those are my two picks. Uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, half of the parlay will be either up or it will either bust in the prelim section. We're counting on your picks, T.O., for the main card, give it a shout them out there and finalize this parlay for us. Well, I had to give a lot of trust in Ian O'Neill last month when we did the team parlay. We had a disagreement over Jelton Almeida versus Curtis Blades. We went with your pick for Curtis Blades in the team parlay. So I'm back in that trust tree again. I'm allowing you to do your thing again. I'm putting my faith in you. I'll stick with Bobby Green here. Like I said, it's a 50 50 fight, anyways. So even if I'm wrong, we'll keep the team parlay alive. And if not, I could say I told you so. But you know, again, we're splitting heads again on the Gaethje versus Holloway fight, but even you've admitted you're not a huge fan no. of that Holloway pick. So, again, I think it's a safe one just to throw in here. It's barely at, at um, negative odds, but, you know, we're fine with that. Alex Pereira, again, I think this is the best value pick on the entire card. Uh, I, I think he's just a stylistic nightmare for Jamal Hill. I think he's going to chew that lead leg up. He's going to hurt him on the way in. And I think it's a really, really long and a tough night for Jamal Hill. But overall, plus 609. We're on a two parlay streak where the team parlay has won both times. Plus 609. What? What? Is that some Nick and Nate Diaz bet? We're calling this the <laughs> Diaz brother bet. This is plus 609, baby. We're going to get it done at UFC 300. I am, that is right, isn't it? 609 is the. It's stop. 209. Oh, shit. I Almost, though. 609 is what? Is that Miami? No, that's 305, but you know, ah, shit. well, yeah, we'll, we'll so, study American. So, so I need to get the abacus, abacus out there. I, I need to study American area codes a little bit better there. So <laughs> I should, should have get me mouth shut, but uh, Theo, bring up your bets. Give us uh give, give, give the audience a, a little look of, of what you're going for, for your main bets. And, and I'll do the same when you're finished. Yeah, man, of course. So we're really just looking at, again, the, the main stuff we've been talking about, Pereira, best value on the card. Um, Gaethje, his line has come down a little bit because, again, the Max Holloway hysteria has hit the mainstream. So I, I think you're getting him at a great price there. Charles Oliveira, dangerous everywhere this fight goes, especially off of his back. And, of course, a very unorthodox guy in front of him when they're on the feet. Very dangerous guy. I had to go for my plus money. Jim Miller. Maybe my heart is getting me sucked into this one, but I don't care either way. I will ride or die with this guy. He's 
earned my respect 44 times he's had to make weight in the ufc and he's made it every single time i had to tip my cap to him he's got my vote and again bonicle sub i got in early on this one now the line has shifted a lot more i'd recommend doing it as soon as possible because it's going to get even worse by the time the fight starts but again plus odds for the most likely outcome of the fight had to do it ian boom solid solid bets there uh i'll just let you pick up my one as well i'll round them up but uh yeah uh, going for Alex Bahia via KO. A lot of uh, I don't I'm doing I don't necessarily like uh, in my early days of bet on the betting show. I, I went for predictions that didn't work. Switched it up a little bit. Gone for straight up money lines. We've we've kind of mixed it up a little bit here. And I am banking on a few predictions here. Alex Bahia by KO plus one twenty against Jamal Hill. I'm going for Max Holloway on the money line plus one one seven for Max Holloway. There. Not super confident on that, but you know. We'll see what happens. Yuri Prohachka plus one hundred. I think that's my. I, I'm. I would almost say I'm, I, I. I feel most confident about that one. Maybe the Pehea KO as well. Uh, plus one hundred Prohachka on the money line. Harrison to win a decision plus one thirty. Davison Figueredo or Cody Garbrandt to win in round one is plus two ten. Money in the bank, son. That's your betting show for UFC three hundred. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching along. As I said, we've got a bunch of content on the YouTube channel all week to cover the prelims, cover the main card. And now we got you covered with some bets here on the betting show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Like I said, have a bit of fun with it. Don't get too serious with the bets. Don't be giving the judges a hard time if your guy doesn't win a close decision. And most of all, enjoy the fights. It's a good one. It's a monster card. I was delighted to be able to break it down with my guy, Theo Lander. Go and follow him at Theo Lander on, on, uh, on social media. And we will catch you for the next pay-per-view event in Brazil for the next betting show. Until then, goodbye, good luck, and we'll chat to you soon.